Uh, before we go to find out the solutions, uh, we are going to touch on the education by with the perspective from an educator. Because as you all know, even though you are the very good clinicians, you may not be a good teacher. So the how to be a good educator, so that we probably we need to inspire by our guest speakers, uh, Professor uh, Tam Kung Ying. She is a senior consultant in the emergency department and uh, education director of the Tang Tok Sing Hospital in Singapore. What she is talking about is uh, 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 a new trained uh, educator for emergency medicine in Singapore. So please welcome the, uh, Professor Tam. Thank you, Axel. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to the Asian Society for this invitation to share about our journey and work in Singapore. Um, Singapore has adopted a slightly different model where we don't think that having an emergency physician holding an academic appointment in an emergency, an academic emergency department in the university is the way to go to nurture educators. And hence, I thought uh, getting this right is probably important. So I've practiced emergency medicine as an emergency physician for more than 25 years and obtained my doctorate in education about six or seven years ago. Um, I have a concurrent appointment as one of the assistant deans with uh, the Lee Kong Chin School of Medicine in Nanyang Technological University. So this sharing really is about um, painting uh, why Singapore over this last 30 years of emergency medicine development has chosen a slightly different path from what has been traditionally described in the uh, emergency medicine literature. So I'm going to cover what is Singapore why the need for educators, what is an educator, what kind of educators do we need, how to nurture educators, and then what's next for us. This is an important piece of background information because without the kind of growth in our GDP, which is indicative of the affluence that Singapore has witnessed, a lot of the things that I need to share would not make sense and probably wouldn't have happened. Singapore gained independence in 1965. 20 years later, Singapore's uh, Ministry of Health recognized emergency medicine as a specialty. In Singapore, the recognition of a specialty means that the junior doctors can pick this specialty and train straight away. So from my generation onwards, none of us need to become a physician or a surgeon or an anesthetist before becoming an emergency physician. We enter into emergency medicine straight away, and that has taken place from 1988 all the way until today. In 1994, the TV series ER from America started and was tremendously popular. And it really inspired a couple of generations of medical students and new doctors, junior doctors to take up emergency medicine as a specialty. And in 1997, riding on the popularity of ER, emergency medicine rotation of three to four weeks duration became mandatory for all the uh, undergraduate medical schools in Singapore, of which there are two. So this is tremendously helpful. That means over their course of studies of five years, every student spends at least three, if not four weeks in the emergency department as a, for the part of their rotation. And at the same time, many of them love it so much that they return to us during their electives as well. The next big change that affected emergency medicine was 12 years ago. In 2009-2010, Singapore switched completely into the US-based residency style and our relationship with the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education started in that academic year. Ten years later, in 2019, we started the separation procedure and we are now almost completing the divorce between Singapore and the US as far as the accreditation model is concerned. And I will talk a little bit more about that in the what's next part towards my summary. So in the background is Singapore's rise in our affluence um, from a third poor country at the point of independence to today, where our GDP per capita in US dollars is 72,800. Um, this 30 years of economic growth has empowered us to do a lot of things. So firstly, when we switched to the American style of residency training uh, 12 years ago, the realization is that the teaching, assessment, education for all health professions, not just the doctors, but nursing, paramedics, and the allied health as well, needs to become professionalized. What does it mean? It means that those of us who teach 
those of us who are assessors or examiners, we need to be formally trained in the relevant teaching and assessment skills. That's the professionalization of medical education in Singapore. Formally began 12 years ago. Particularly in emergency medicine context, um, like all of us here on this uh, webinar, we have a lot of pride being good teachers and we inherently love teaching, which is really, really great. We have a high volume of patients as Colin, as well as my uh, colleagues from India and Taiwan have already referred to. We have a wide spectrum of cases and diseases. And in Singapore, we realize that teaching effectively, not just the medical students, but the junior doctors who have yet to choose a specialty is a very effective means of security, securing our pipeline of future emergency physicians. So therefore, within the larger national contact of Singapore and emergency medicine in Singapore, the need for emergency medicine educators was very clear. So what then is an educator? Because we throw the term around and it probably means different things to different people. So I'm sharing a paper by Ron Harden. Uh, this is uh, 22 years ago when he described the 12 roles of teachers. So when I first came across that paper back in 2001 or 2002, I was very excited because this picture kind of really described everything that a clinical teacher should be doing. Uh, and a lot of this is very applicable to the way we teach in the emergency department. But this picture inherently looked very messy. And what the Ministry of Health in Singapore has done, and that's a very typical approach that we do in Singapore, which is, uh, a central organization or central unit to bring everybody together and get consensus across the whole of Singapore. So our perspective when we put together this faculty development roadmap or framework is really to clarify when we talk about ed an educator, what exactly are the roles or the combination of roles that we expect that emergency physicians undertake. So there are five roles as defined by the Ministry of Health and I added the sixth one at the bottom. First, there is the role of a teacher where the domain is about teaching and facilitating the learner's learning. Second is the assessor, which is the assessment of their learning. Third is the planner, which is designing and planning learning activities and experiences that will lead to accomplishment of learning outcomes. Fourth is the scholar, which is somebody who is involved in education research and scholarship. Fifth is the leader, that means the educator who is in charge of educational management and leadership, whether it is within the department, within the specialty, within the residency program, or within the medical school. And finally, I added the welfare officer for want of a better description, and this should never be neglected. The professional identity formation, especially for our trainee, our residents, and the pastoral care that a lot of them will need, and all the more so as Colin has described in the past two and a half years of the pandemic, the residents, the trainees who are very much on the front line than us, but are much younger, less life, life experiences, actually felt a lot more stress than the senior ones like myself. So with each of the role and the domain, we then mapped out the competencies. So when we talk about an educator, the next question that we ask is, what role does this emergency physician need to take up? Is it purely a teacher? Is it a teacher and an assessor? Is it a teacher, assessor, or planner? Or is it something a uh, much more, a uh, much higher level like a leader? Okay. So mapping all this out gives a lot of clarity because the next question that we ask is across a whole spectrum of learners that we deal with, of which medical students and residents are, of course, a lot, a lot of our time spent on them. We also have other learners like our nurses, our advanced practice nurses in emergency medicine, our paramedics, and increasingly for Singapore, we begin to take on the allied health because some of them are specializing in musculoskeletal diseases that are commonly seen in the emergency department and we contribute towards their training as well. So with the roles that are defined, the domains that are defined and the competencies mapped up for each of the roles, we now mapped it across to answer the question, what kind of educators do we need? And of course, we are going to concentrate a lot more on the medical students and residents because this is pipeline. This is where future emergency physicians are going to emerge. So we do a lot of teaching for the medical students and the residents and certainly for the other learners as well. For the medical students, because of their 
uh, four weeks rotation in emergency medicine, we are definitely assessors for the formative developmental kind of assessment that happens during their four weeks rotation. Um, a number of us are also involved in their summative year end exams in the medical school. And for the residents, of course, we are their assess assessors for both the formative and the summative exams. We also plan the curriculum very much for our residents and occasionally we do plan the uh, curriculum and the learning activities for the medical students. As far as being a scholar is concerned, it is still very aspirational. So this is the part where we can learn from our counterparts, especially in Taiwan. As far as educational leader is concerned, um, the medical students in the medical school, a lot of us contribute towards the uh, portion of the school curriculum for emergency medicine. But a, a very few of us will actually contribute towards the whole of medical school curriculum. And for residents, of course, we are the leaders in terms of management, leadership, governance for our residents' education. And for the welfare officer part, the residents look up towards us to provide the mentoring, the guidance, the scaffolding in their journey to form the professional identity as an emergency physician and towards all the basic pastoral care that they need. Um, some of us do take up this role for the medical students, but much less compared to our residents. With that then comes the million dollar question, how do we mature educators? Three pointers um, as I look back on emergency medicine's journey in Singapore for the past 30 years. Number one, our system enablers. Number two, the specialty coming together to mandate the requirements. And number three, which I guess is probably still unique in uh, our world, we actually have formal assessment of our resident teaching skills. So the first thing is the system enablers and funding, secure assured funding. Without this funding, Singapore would never be where we are today for emergency medicine and actually for all the specialties in Singapore. So we have a central source of funding under the medical students, which is governed both by the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health. These two ministries put out the funding necessary annually to fund the manpower, to teach the manpower, to do assessment, the manpower to plan. What does this mean? For the lead for emergency medicine, representing a medical school, his time of 0.2 FTE or 20% of his time is paid for by the two ministries into the hospital and into my department so that his workload, the clinical workload is reduced by 20%. He still has to contribute to the workload 80% of his time, but the 20% of manpower of his time is dedicated to teach to assess, to plan, and to provide the welfare officer function for the medical students. So assured funding for manpower is very important because we cannot expect the emergency physicians to take up 100% clinical work and then to use their personal time of 10, 20% to teach students and teach residents. It can last for maybe two, three years because we are so passionate about teaching, but from a system point of view, from a national point of view, it is not sustainable. So funding came in 12 years ago for residents, seven years ago for the medical students, and it is a major enabler and a game changer. So we have secured funding for the medical students teaching assessment planning. We have secured funding for the residents teaching assessment planning, leadership and welfare officer. So that's the first source of funding. We also have secured funding for faculty development. I said at the beginning that we are professionalizing and we have professionalized medical education, which means those of us who teach, who assess, who plan, who lead and perform welfare officer function, we need training. That's what faculty development is all about. And again, the two ministries provide the funding for us to attend relevant causes, upskill ourselves, and the Ministry of Health provide funding for all of us who are involved in resident education. So the system enablers is a game changer. And without this, Singapore would not be where we are today. Secondly, this is about the specialty requirements. So this is where emergency medicine at the national level came together. And the, the umbrella term is the residency advisory committee. There's an equivalent committee for the medical students as well. 
we put together the mandatory requirements of the emergency physician educators. So under medical student, uh, the students come in for mandatory posting. Therefore, there must be a program. There must be a schedule. There are certain core topics that must be covered. The emergency physician teaching hours are recorded and the students provide feedback. The same happens to the residents as well. There is a five-year mandatory uh, program delivered nationally as well as delivered within each institution. Teaching hours are captured and the resident feedback scores are captured. In the role as an assessor and a posting test for the medical student, the school OSCE, we contribute, the school written exam, we also contribute towards the, uh, the school level exams. Same for our residents, whether it is a formative workplace-based assessment or the summative primary, intermediate and exit exams, we have all the KPIs laid out there. As far as planning, same thing. There's KPI for planning learning activities mapped to the national outcomes, which for the medical students came out in 2018, and for the program of learning for our residents, also mapped to the national outcomes, which we already adopted the American version from 2009. Scholarship is still aspirational for the medical students, but for our residents, it is mandatory that those of us who hold core faculty position, we have to demonstrate completion of scholarly activities or scholarly works on an annual basis. Leadership for medical students is opportunistic. So I'm one of the few who actually hold a deanship position in a medical school. But for the uh, residency, it is mandatory. There are education management and education leadership KPIs that are specified in the national standards. And for the welfare uh, officer function, uh, it is optional and opportunistic for the medical student, but mandatory because residents burn out, resident fatigue. All these are KPIs tied to the residency program at the national level. So this is the other piece that is very big and again, a game changer, where at a national level, we have specified both for our two key groups of learners, the medical students, as well as our residents. And finally, we are probably one of the few uh, countries in the world where we actually assess our residents' teaching skills. So in 2010, when all this started, all the way up to 2019, we have a teaching viva, which is a component of our five-component exit exam at the end of the five years of residency training. So there's a topic that will be decided by the teaching viva exam committee. This topic is released to the uh, residents sitting for the teaching viva two weeks in advance. So the residents, the candidates have two weeks to consult the teaching experts like myself in their own emergency department, they will write a word proposal, submit it to the teaching uh, at the, the examiners, and also prepare a deck of PowerPoint slides. And on the Viva day itself, the examiners will interview the residents, uh, Viva style. They will grade the proposal and they make a pass fail decision. In 2020, 2019, we switched from a Viva to a teaching portfolio. So now my senior residents over 24 months um, would collate evidence of their work as a teacher, as an assessor, as a planner, as a welfare officer. So this maps back to the faculty development work, um, uh, framework that we already have uh, for residents. We don't think it is fair to stress them as a scholar and as a leader, but certainly over 24 months, the opportunity to pick up teaching skills, assessment skills, planning skills, and welfare officer skills to take care of the junior learners who are medical students, they are junior uh, residents, and even the medical officers who take into our emergency department. And on the interview day for the portfolio, the assessors will interview the residents based on their individual portfolio and make a pass-fail decision. This is a major game, change, game changer for us in ensuring that the basic package of teaching, assessment, planning, and welfare officer skills are now spread out across the whole of Singapore's emergency medicine residency. So how do we make sure that uh, this is sustainable? Well, uh, typically, again, like uh, things that the way we do things in Singapore, we put it into the uh, learning um, uh, package. Over the final two years of senior residency, our residents get formal didactic teaching and workplace learning opportunities uh, under the supervision of program directors and core faculty for the key roles of teacher, assessor, planner, and welfare officer. And in the assessment column on the right-hand side, they are observed and given feedback 
by our program directors, by the faculty in how they teach, in how they assess, in how they plan the students or the junior uh, residents' curriculum and learning activities, and how they supervise and assist the growth of medical students as well as junior, uh, their junior residents and the medical officers. Again, this becomes part and parcel of a virtual cycle that we're already in. So what's next? In 2020 and 10, uh, all the way up to 2019, over a period of 10 years, one decade, we have more than 200 emergency medicine trainees and residents who have successfully completed their training and passed the teaching portfolio or the teaching viva. So everyone who exits from our formal traineeship and residency system already have the foundational teaching or educator skills. And this is also reflected by the fact that among all the 45 to 46 specialties in Singapore, emergency medicine has the highest percentage of specialists, emergency physicians who actually go on to complete a master in health profession education or a master in medical education or a master in clinical education or equivalent. That speaks a lot and really secures the future of not just teachers, but educators, especially in the realm of education leadership. From 2020 onwards, the first big change at a national level, so it's not just uh, emergency medicine, nationally, we feel that we have learned enough from our American partners and initiated the separation procedures with the U.S. Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, which is ACGME. Um, Singapore is the first country outside of America where the ACGME form a partnership. Uh, the past decade has been highly successful for both Singapore and an Americans, but uh, in Singapore, we feel that we are ready to go our own. So the most exciting thing that's happening is come next year, 2023, July, exactly one year from now, emergency medicine is among the group A specialties that will transition completely into our own Singapore's accreditation system with our own set of standards and requirements. We learn a lot from the Americans, but it is time to become independent. Next thing that we do need to work on is to elevate our education, research and scholarship. And this should be a collective effort. And of course, with the kind of background um, where every existing emergency medicine resident that will become a brand new emergency physician consultant, the basic skills are built. How to continue to build on this excellent baseline, continue to enhance our residents' skills in teaching and assessment, and therefore to continue to um, bring on board more educators. That would be our challenges for Singapore at least. With that, I've come to the summary. So Singapore's context necessitated the professionalization of medical education. And that is very fortunate because our government is one of those where they walk the talk. If they feel the need for professionalization, they would follow up with the funding that's needed. And we have been very blessed. Emergency medicine context necessitated the systematic approach to nurture the next generation of educators for emergency medicine and actually for the nation as well. And Singapore EM's education achievement today has been facilitated very much by a national faculty development framework that uh, we have adopted by system enablers, especially the funding for manpower and the funding for faculty development, by our specialty coming together to mandate the requirements of all faculty and by formalizing the assessment of every resident teaching skills as part of the exit requirement. And those things have enabled us to be where we are today. With that, I hand the time back to Axel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tam. Uh, indeed, I need to congratulate Singapore that actually has uh, uh, paid a lot of the, uh, emphasis on the nutrient uh, uh, educator and especially to incorporate teaching skills in the resident training program. Actually, well, I think that's uh, uh, give a lesson to uh, most of the, the those who uh, engage in training to think about uh, whether we should do the same things for their own training program. I think uh, most of us will be more interested to discuss on the uh, the details of your teaching seal programs and probably we'll leave it to the panel discussions. Well, uh, with the further delay, I would like to proceed to the, uh, the last speaker before the 
the IEM sections 